Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Connected Inc. 2023. This is Wacom's celebration of all things art, education, technology, and creative chaos. Uh, my name is Megan, and I will be your host for our next session. I'm the Senior Manager of Brand Experience here at Wacom, and I'm coming to you live from the Wacom Experience Center in Portland, Oregon. And like Pam, who hosted our previous session today, I have the honor and privilege through my job of working with some of the most amazing and creative minds in the world and the people that will inevitably take over and lead the path for creatives in the future. Uh, I'm excited to kick off our next session titled Animation as Research, a new approach to climate change research, where we'll learn all about the UPenn Climate Animation and Research Studio, which is a mobile animation studio that engages six students in research and animation on location in countries vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Before I introduce our speakers, just a few housekeeping notes and things to remember. Uh, we welcome and encourage questions from the audience. So if you have questions for our speakers, please drop them in the chat. I'm going to compile those and we will get to those questions at the end of the session. Uh, and with that, I will stop talking to you. But before I stop talking, let me introduce our speakers to you and welcome them to the Connected Inc. stage. Uh, I'd love to introduce Joshua Mosley, Professor of Fine Arts and Penn Animation as Research Lab co-founder, and two of our animator researcher students, Melody Kuo and Annabelle Sumardi. Thank you all for being here. We are super excited to hear about your guys' creative journey. Uh, why don't you guys take it away? Tell us a little bit more about yourselves. And I will hand the mic over to you, Josh. Thanks, all. Thanks, Megan. Uh, Melody, do you want to start? Do you want to tell us about yourself? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm a senior at Penn studying communication and minoring in design and consumer psychology. So I joined the team since last winter, and we all worked on episode four. Um, I have done research in the past, and I also really want to pursue a career in design. And so I decided to join the team because it's the combination of both. So it contains elements of both research and animation. Mm -hmm. Annabelle. All right, I can go next. So I'm a third year studying data science and design, and this project um, as Melody said, was the perfect collaboration of analytics and design for me. And I joined the team this summer, um, and I've mostly been working on our sixth episode, which is still in the works as of now. Um, and we were just so excited to be working with Wacom this summer. We even have one of the tablets in the office right now. Um, and so uh, I'm Joshua Mosley. I, I, um... I guess I, I, I've been an artist for many years and I've worked independently on uh, producing animations that I show in art galleries and museums. And uh, I've been teaching at the University of Pennsylvania since 2000. And uh, over the years, we've expanded. Uh, I, I think when I started, um, I, I brought in some of the first computer animation classes and now we, we teach mixed media and hand-drawn. And um, over the years, uh, uh, I've uh, had a lot of students that have gone into the industry, but mostly uh, the students that, that take my classes then go into the industry, or, uh, go into the industry as technical directors from the in sort of computer science and engineering um, track. Track, And so what happened a couple of years ago is I, I uh, was teaching the hand-drawn animation class, and one of my students um, found a position with uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Simon Richter. Simon was starting to produce this series of animations called Poltergeist. And uh, and Justine um, and, uh, uh, and Simon um, and uh, three other students produced the first episode of the Poltergeist series. After they published it, Simon and I met and we started to talk about collaborating and how we could produce more of these, how we could produce them faster, how we could make this bigger. And so by the time the summer rolled around, we had hired six students and we were trying to produce two episodes at the same time. And we were doing this remotely without traveling. And most of these videos are about issues uh, outside of the United States. Uh, issues where uh, uh, countries and and um, coastal areas that are at risk of uh, uh, sea level rise from climate change um, and um, 
and uh, and, and these 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 countries are developing strategies to sort of defend and um, and protect the communities that live near this, the the coast. Um, these are these are the issues that we were dealing with, and there are a lot of these issues on the East Coast. But but um, we've been uh, Simon had had been looking at the Netherlands, and um, and so uh, the first summer we uh, we had two teams going, and then um, this last summer I think this is like the third summer now, uh, we decided to apply for grants and to look uh, for an opportunity to uh, to take all of the students to the Netherlands so that we could. Um, uh, interview experts there, uh, see the see the sites that we were making the animations about, and draw from the landscape directly, so that so that the the images would be the images that we were producing, the ideas and the sort of engagement would be more informed. Um, we we had we had been doing Zoom interviews this whole time, and this started during COVID, but but this was the this was the it seemed like a really solid op opportunity to travel and, and and to do this. So in the meantime, what you're looking at here is our website of the Penn uh, Animation as Research Lab, and and there's different types of projects that we've done so far. One is that Simon and I have taught a environmental animation studio class where we've worked with different experts across the university that deal with um, issues. Uh, climate climate related issues like uh, uh, coral bleaching, um, uh, the the issues of uh, sustainable tourism, and uh, and the issues of housing that that are caused uh, by um, uh, by climate uh, change, and and so so that's that's a class that we co-taught together. Um, the team we've we've had twelve students that have worked for us so far, and uh, usually the the gig is about a three month uh, three three month long summer job that sometimes rolls into the year because the production sometimes continue. And uh, we took uh, six students with us to the Netherlands. This is this is the alter ego of Simon. You see Simon Richter there. This is the alter ego of Simon that Simon um, and the first team created called Poltergeist. And uh, and he's a sort of cartoon character that talks with Simon's voice. And um, uh, and then there's very variations of this character uh, that represent different countries. And so in this case, this is this is um, Indonesia. Um, and uh, and then the the videos. Um, Simon's been writing the scripts, and the videos sort of take you on a journey um, uh, through the issues and and through the locations. Um, and and we're trying to draw um, as precisely as possible the kinds of buildings and landscapes that we're that we're talking about in this. And so we've been using a lot of we've been using the internet um, quite a bit. We've been using photographs um, uh, to draw from. But now this is the first opportunity that we had to um, to go and really uh, spend so that we were there for a month and we went to a small that we were based in a small town called Hostrecht and Hostrecht uh, what we did is we rented an Airbnb for the students uh, that was an old farmhouse and uh, it it was a two-story farmhouse and um, this was a 25 minute bike ride it was very remote it was a 25 bike ride 25 minute bike ride from a city called Hauda that you probably know because of the the cheese that uh, a lot of, before I went I thought it was called um, Gouda but <laughs> but when we when, when we arrived in Howda we 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 realized okay this is this is this is where we're at so why did we choose Howda well if you look at this map um, the red dot is Howda and it's in one of the lowest areas of the country of the Netherlands and so on the right this is a um, a uh, measuring uh, kind of, I have a bug right here, <laughs> just kill that bug. Um, there's a, this is a measuring stick. And so you can see that we're 5.3 meters below sea level. The zero on the top there is, uh, the red line is, is, is sea level. And so we, we, we chose one of the lowest um, areas of the country and the country has two issues, uh, two issues that it's, that it's, that it's worried about. One is subsidence, the ground sinking, and the other is, uh, the sea level rising. And, um, here's here. It, it, so as we, as we traveled through the country, we met with experts, geologists, uh, uh, um, um, historians, uh, uh, scientists, uh, um, uh, uh all kinds, all kinds of people, and this is one of the slides that we saw that that shows the years along the bottom and the issues that cause subsidence. And one one of the issues was um, adding embankments around the country. 
Uh, and then what happens is um, canals are formed and the water level lowers and then water, the sort of soil is drained and then the, 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 the soil compacts and, um, and, and they keep wanting to lower the water level so that the houses, um, the, the, the foundations of the houses can stay in good shape. And so, um, and the farmers don't want the cows to be in squishy ground. So, so there's kind of a, a, a cycle of lowering the, the water table and then the, the, the ground subsiding. And then the other, the other issue is that um, these embankments and, and dikes need to be raised um, in case of uh, tidal surges. So um, uh, there's been um, really massively destructive floods in the country. And, uh, and so here's a couple of plates that we saw in, in a museum with artworks that talk about the, the, um, both the destruction and also the organization of the country to, to um, uh, secure the, the coast uh, and to protect from future floods. And, and so what that involves is um, pumping water out of lower ground and then pumping it up into higher ground. So back to Howda, we were in this town called Howda and look at the water level. These are, these are houses and um, it's so, it's so, um, they're keeping it so high so that the foundation um, stays, so the wood foundation that the piles that are below the ground here stay in good shape. And sort of support the houses so that they, they don't they don't continue to sort of sink down. So the water level needs to be there, um, but at the same time that's very risky. But they have control over it because they have these these pumps. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, to Annabelle to talk about some of the other people that we met. Perfect. So we met with a lot of different experts. One of them being Yim Van Belzen, who you can see here, sort of pointing to the oyster reef. Um, and he is an estuarine ecologist at the Netherlandic Institute for Oceanic Research. And he's been experimenting with using these oyster reefs to naturally soften the tidal waves and reinforce the shore. And this was one of our first encounters with what is called a nature-based solution. So we were actually able to go out into nature and see the oyster reefs for ourselves, which was an incredible experience. And then next up, um, we got to meet with Martin Baptiste who was a marine ecologist, and we met on the island of Tessel, and I'm actually wearing a Tessel t-shirt right now. Um, and we had seen how sand could be used to reinforce the shore. Uh, but Martin explained to us how the amount of sand beneath the sea is limited and how it can actually disturb the marine life to be mining that sand. So that's why using sand to reinforce shores has a lot of limitations. And then next up, we got to meet with Mon Shapers, um, and he is a professor at the University of Groningen, and he helped us to understand how people lived on terps thousands of years ago. Um, terps being these human-built mounds of land that are safe from flooding because they're actually raised higher um, than the rest of the landscape. Um, and he actually allowed us to hand pull up a core sample from one of these terps. Um, and we were able to see sort of how they were constructed over the years. And he even showed us little things like how you can see uh, when a natural disaster actually occurred uh, because of the way the sediment layers changed drastically. Okay, thanks, Annabelle. And Melody? Um, yes, and then we also got a chance to meet with an amazing artist called um, Jeroen Helmer. So he's the illustrator for the ARK Rewilding Netherlands. And if you look at his illustrations, so they really look like one of those you see in like bio biology textbooks and encyclopedias. They are really detailed and professional and they all have their own unique spatial depths. And he also talked about like the importance of different keystone species and how they support different ecosystems. So each of his work has um, a keystone species in the center with its like surrounding environment portrayed. And then we also got to tour his studio, which is filled with his drawings and sketches of wildlife. And I think he really offered us like a new perspective for our project because it's like putting nature instead of humans into focus is an act of rewriting history and his work advocates for like um, re-envisioning re like the re rewilding process. And after spending time at his studio, we also went to the lake beside his studio <laughs> to sketch. So we also like drew birds, lily pads, trees, like everything we saw. And, and it was a really unique and invaluable experience. And then 
the other day we also went to um Utrecht University to meet with um different like geographers there and then they all gave us lectures about land subsidence and also showed us like various um geodata um and then we also talked to Jana Cox so she's an expert about dredging and sand um she gave a talk about river sedimentation in the Rhine River and so the process of dredging is removing sediments from rivers so that large cargo ships can pass. And it is done mainly for economic reasons. But um, like boats are getting bigger and bigger, so we'll need bigger channels and even more dredging. And this has become a severe problem in the port of Rotterdam, which is the biggest port in the Netherlands. And then her lecture, after her lecture, we also went to this lab in the geography department, and then it has this huge metronome machine that mimics an actual river. And then students and researchers there are able to like conduct actual experiments on there to examine like the fluvial dynamics and also the effectiveness of dam constructions. So these insights really helped me and also my teammates with our animation sequence because like just by looking at the fluvial lab and understanding like the mechanisms behind sedimentation, we developed like a better picture of dredging operations and also some natural or human made processes that is really important to what we're trying to show to viewers. Thank you. Uh, so now I want to move into some of the goals um, uh, that Simon and I've had uh, for the project. Um, I think initially Simon was looking for a way to publish uh, uh, the the sort of uh, different perspectives um, to a broader audience uh, without publishing written papers. Um, and so we've been able to reach more than 20,000 people um, with these videos so far, but it doesn't matter, I think, how many. Um, what, what What's really important is that they're the right people, the, the, the people who are making decisions in the countries or who um, live in countries who make decisions in, in other countries who are looking to the Netherlands for how they're strategizing about, uh, about sea level rise. So, um, we know that uh, a large percentage of our viewership is in um, the Netherlands. And, and we know that um, one of the most important forums is actually LinkedIn. So the, the, the videos get posted on YouTube and then the discussion sort of begins on LinkedIn. And, um, and, this, and, and uh, each of our videos, we consult with a, a, a large number of experts. I think I think I'm, I've been working on the credits for this one. I think we have probably like 30 people um, that we've interviewed, that we've consulted with, that we showed rough drafts of the video to to get feedback to make sure that to to make sure that the information that we're publishing is precise. And so those people end up um, being partners with us and um, and and take the videos, uh, you know, po repost the videos, re um, comment on them and so on. And so, and so this discussion, uh, this is really a sort of a conversation, um, uh, something that advances the conversation on LinkedIn. So that's one of our goals. Another goal is, is that the students um, have an opportunity to work on something and model a new kind of career. So rather than um, maybe going into uh, advertising or animation or um, whatever their their other major uh, might offer them right out of school, what we're hoping is that work like this, where you, where where the students are deeply involved in both the research and animation, will create a kind of um, a kind of uh, I guess a kind of artist that can that that can both um, be involved in research and also and also the production of uh, science communication. So that's uh, that's what we're hoping is that we're we're building a model for that. And then I think there's another aspect of what, what's happening is that in some of these cases, we're bringing together three or more different researchers, and then the project itself is bringing them all together, these 30 people. And, um, and so uh, here there's um, uh, landscape architects, there's uh, geologists and um, historians, and uh, they're not all together in this picture. They're in three different pictures, but the but the project is bringing them together, um, bringing their perspectives together, and and we're trying to interweave them into the video. So 
there's something called, I'm going to move to the next topic here. There's something called the, the principles of animation that Disney, um, uh, that, the, that the Disney animators introduced, but I'm going to, I'm going to misuse this and call it animation principles. These are the principles that I think that, um, that, that we've, we've come across that are the, 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 the ideas, the basic ideas of why we're using animation. So here on the left is a paper, um, by one of the researchers that we, um, interviewed. And on the right is the sort of consolidated image of the concept and the problem, um, of, they're just not being enough space to mine sand and that it being too destructive and that there's a lot of people that want to do it and it's needed for a lot of different things. And so that kind of all comes together into this animated picture. So the, so one of our principles is, is, is that the, the drawing and animation can simplify complex scientific or sort of uh, human problems um, in a, in a very concise, memorable image. Another another sort of principle is about is about transportation. This is narrative transportation. It's it's while you're watching the animation, um, you're you're in the sort of state of a passive passive viewer in a sense. Um, you've been taken to another place. Uh, you you can critically listen to it, but you're also um, you're fully immersed in it. So so you've been in a way trans transported by the narrative, and you're you're in this other space. So that that sort of the animation allows us to sort of get the attention and take and sort of hold hold the viewers sort of in an immersive way. Um, so so I think that that's one one of our principles. Here's another one. This is on a smaller scale. It's sort of a micro scale. Those are the frames of animation. And then somewhere in between those frames, when you're perceiving this kind of persistence of vision, when you're when you're getting this motion, you have that's your brain. That's my poor drawing of the brain. Um, that drawing of the brain is what you need to do between frames one and two, and two and three, and so that's a that's a kind of engagement that's maybe more physiological, and it's. Um, uh, and this happens as you sort of watch animation. There's something that grabs you. Now, it could this could be on any scale. It could be on the, the scale of frames per second, or it could be on the scale of shot to shot, or it could be on the scale of maybe episode to episode. It's the way that we put things together. So I wondered, and this is something I've been working on uh, for a long time, like if we animate at eight frames per second, it looks more choppy, but if we animate at 24 frames per second, it looks more smooth. But I think that that our brains need to work more to see this kind of motion when we're at a lower frame rate and that we become a little bit more passive on the other hand, but we don't have to work quite as hard if it's if it's at a higher frame rate. So I don't know if eight or 24 is better. We, we've been working in, in our production at a pretty low frame rate. Um, um, partly that's because we're producing 16 minutes of video in a summer, you know, with six people, that's a lot of, it's a, it's a lot of production, especially, um, because we're all learning how to, how to animate sometimes, you know, for the, we've, uh, I think almost all, everybody on the team has taken one animation class. Um, but we're still learning about the production and about the, uh, where we can be efficient and how we can do this succinctly. So, um, what I'm wondering here is whether the continuity, and I hope that there's questions or comments about this afterwards, whether whether lowering the frame rate creates a higher level of engagement um, and uh, um, and whether whether animation is sort of functioning somehow like this. The next one is um, about drawing. Uh, this is something that came up in my class last week. Which box is better? The one that the one that I drew like seven times on the right to try to make it look like the right square proportion and it's still not right. And you can see the wiggly, the sort of wiggly lines that, you know, and this this I've, I drew with the Cintiq on the right. The one on the left is a orthographic view that I found as a PNG file on, on Chrome. And uh, it does flip a little, it's got other effects to it because I didn't write, draw the back, but is the one that looks like it's hand-drawn uh, more sincere? And the one on the left is maybe more theoretical or, or, or geometric. Does the one on the right um, uh, is it more disarming or does it feel like it's a one, you have a one-on-one -on -one connection with the person who drew it and the one on the left, um, maybe it's, it, it, it has some other kind of, um, affect. I'm not sure, um, about this, but I, I, I'm believing that hand-drawn animation has a certain kind of disarming quality and, um, and that's, um, and that's important. Okay. So the idea here is, um, that as you draw things and you look at them longer, 
you can learn your ideas get more specific and you learn and you sort of you sort of learn about the world this was an experiment last week in my hand drawn class i on the i had a pop quiz on the left is i asked everyone to draw winnie the pooh i first asked them if everyone knew who winnie the pooh was because i wanted to make sure that um and it, everyone knew who winnie the pooh was on the left is drawing winnie the pooh without googling it uh, Winnie the Pooh without looking it up, um, just from your memory. So I had I had uh, twenty different drawings of Winnie the Pooh. They all looked different. Um, uh, there was all all different levels of uh, specificity to it. So then I showed Winnie the Pooh on the screen for five seconds, uh, turned it off, and had them draw it again. And then I, and then we did it again. Uh, showed it for another five seconds. And so every time that we looked back at this sort of reference image, even though we it's it's something that's that's familiar, like if we're drawing trees or draw uh, if we're trying to draw water, or if we're trying to draw sand, every time that we look back at it after we've drawn it. Um, We've taken what we knew and put it down on paper, put it down on 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 um, and you know uh, on our on our on our tablets, and then we go back and we look and we can look for new details that we that we just couldn't look for before because we had such basic ideas about um, about what we knew, and so I, um, this this experiment I'm going to hope I'm hoping I can continue um, with with uh, in other ways in other drawing classes, um, so we can kind of um, watch how we learn through drawing. So our process in the in the animation um, starts with these research interviews and site visits. Then we move to uh, uh, drafting a script, which is which is largely Simon's work, and um, you know it involves it involves discussion. Um, si Simon has a list of ideas that he thinks are um, important. We talk about those ideas. And then we move on to visual metaphors. And um, the students all did very sort of rough, loose, open-ended drawings based on what the topic was that we thought we were going to um, address in the, in the two videos this summer. And then Simon um, looks at those drawings, and we talk about those drawings. We talk about the visual metaphors. And we moved, and, and Simon revises the script. And then we have a, a written script, and we use Google Docs, and all the students see it. And, and Simon has notes in that, in that Google Doc about um, maybe specific locations that he's referring to, has the script with the, beside it, the, the sort of detailed notes. And the students develop a storyboard. And usually, um, to do this, we break up the script into sections. Uh, where it's like it's almost like sub chapters, and then each student is working on like uh, maybe a fifth or a sixth of the of a uh, basically about a minute. Each student's working on about a minute of animation, storyboarding a, a, a complete chapter. And then what happens is we move on to uh, recording uh, scratch recording, so we have an idea of the exact timing, and we align the storyboard to that scratch recording, and we call that an animatic. Then we send the animatic, the video, to the experts that we've interviewed, and they give us feedback on, you know, where we're precise, where we're wrong, um, where the image could be uh, uh, more descriptive, where there might be a better example if we pick a different location. And so then we revise the storyboard, um, update the animatic, and we move into the rough animation. So we, um, where that squiggly line is, everything before that we did in the Netherlands in one month. And then everything after it, we did in two months over the summer, um, almost everything. We did the rough, the fine, the color, and then the voiceover and the sound has been happening this fall. Um, and so the voiceover and sound, I've been working on sound and um, Simon is the, is the voice. So here's a picture, a couple of pictures of the experts that we um, met with. Here's um, some of the locations. And then here are some of the storyboard drawings that the students did. And so this is a mix of um, working on paper and then taking pictures with iPhones when we were in the Netherlands and working on the Wacom's and um, and uh, the idea is just to work as quickly as possible so we can get it into the animatic and then we would review these um, uh, kind of timed out uh, storyboards um, and this is in the interior of the farmhouse you can kind of get a glimpse of what that looked like and then we brought them into, so for technically for animation, what we're doing is we're bringing the storyboards into uh, Toon Boom Harmony. And we can draw the line work and um, create all of the animation. And then we can share color palettes. And so on the right, you see sort of a shared color palette that the whole team um, used that was based on previ previous episodes plus new colors for the, the this uh, these last two episodes. 
And we developed those color palettes and then uh, we could share them so there would be sort of consistency across the sections, at least with color, even if everybody's drawing is a little bit different. We weren't trying to make, make every drawing look the same. It's okay if the style changes a lot, but, it, but the colors, the color and the sound and the voiceover is kind of what holds it together. And then what you see on the bottom left is so we, we did a certain amount of drawing and um, for the storyboard, but then on the bottom left, we had to go back to the, the 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 paper. We had to go back to the writing, to the science communication writing, to kind of find out exactly what would it look like. Because we had sort of just had a rough idea of how things would be laid out in this coastal area with windmills and um, and uh, 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 um, uh, uh, fisheries and you know and, and all the sort of components. And so we had to go back to the map to kind of analyze that more so that it could be drawn more precisely. And there on the bottom right, you see Simon in my studio uh, recording the audio. So this is the end of the slides. And what we can do now is move on to the, uh, the, the, the excerpts. We have two excerpts from our Poltergeist episode five. Uh, that um, is almost done, will be released in the next couple of weeks. And we're, it's about five minutes long, two different little sections. And we'll take a look at that. The hourglass is a common motif in the art of the Netherlands' somewhat tarnished golden age. It symbolizes mortality and the passing of time. Let's imagine the Netherlands in a pensive mood, pondering the hourglass, the flow of time, the changing climate, extreme rainfall, extreme heat and drought, sinking soil, the rising seas. How will the Netherlands protect its low-lying cities in the long term? Can the polders of its green heart and its Vadenzee islands be secured? Will the sea once again reconfigure the coast? Will all that precious cultural heritage and happy industriousness eventually descend into the narrow funnel of destruction? In moments of reflection, it dawns on the Netherlands that its future can be measured in units of sand and the flow of sediment. For an industrialized, water-based, consumer goods conveyance system, I think that's a fair description of what the Dutch have made of the Rhine and the Maas. Sand and sediment are the grit that hinders smooth operation. Remember that tarnished golden age? Colonies and trade, slave trade included, brought an abundance of wealth and goods into Dutch harbors. Dynamic rivers and tidal influx moved sand around in ways that hindered shipping and, from a human perspective, increased flood risk. Building dikes along the river resulted in greater sediment accumulations in downstream estuaries. The sea did its part by silting up harbors, putting profits from international trade at risk. Something had to be done. While rivers need to be deepened, which opens them up to storm surges and salt from the sea, beaches and dunes on islands and along the coast erode and are hungry for more sand. Gently sloping beaches with foreshores and high dunes are as integral to the Dutch Delta program as dikes and storm surge barriers. All of them require maintenance. The Dutch are getting smarter about coastal dynamics. They've become sand wizards. By tricking nature into doing some of the heavy lifting, they conjure up beaches and levitate dunes. Take the sand motor. 21 million cubic meters of sand were strategically piled up near an eroding beach. Wind, waves, and currents did the rest, distributing the sand according to their whim, just as the wizard had foreseen. Worldwide, it's regarded as a brilliant example of building with nature. It is. Barrier islands, such as Amelant, tend to wander. Erosion on one end, accretion on the other. The island of Schiermonnikoog has already crossed the border from one province to the next. To keep islands in place, the Netherlands introduces millions of cubic meters of sand at the eroding end and relies on currents and waves to nourish beaches while winds lift sand onto the dunes. Feeding time? Every four years. Meanwhile, there's so much sediment in the system, 
to keep the shallow channel for the Amelant Ferry clear, four dredgers work round the clock. They can't even afford to cut their engines. Sand would clog the works. The Dutch Gold Coast. That's what dredging companies call these island beaches, a less than subtle hint that the Dutch have even colonized themselves. Sea level rise means rising profits, here and abroad, where an appetite for land reclamation fuels demand for sand and dredgers. As for the Netherlands, it reserves massive stores of sand in the midst of the crowded North Sea, where wind energy parks, anchorage areas, crisscrossing cables and pipelines, fisheries, and nature reserves assert their claims too. With each centimeter of sea level rise, the amount of sand required increases. So we can take questions now if there's any questions. Absolutely. This is Megan again. Let me turn my microphone back on and pull up my document with questions. Um, that was first off, that was lovely. Thank you for sharing your guys' story and that animation with us. I know in the chat, uh, there's a lot of shout outs and cheers for the Sand Wizard and that coastal fist bump uh, is now everyone's new favorite. Um, for those in the chat, if you haven't had time to drop your questions, please feel free to do so. Uh, I'll start with our first question. Um, assuming that you want to continue this project, what other countries or regions do you want to bring attention to with your art? Um, I, I think we do want to continue this project, and um, there's two ways. One is that the the animation as a research lab, um, I think my hope is that we'll find other collaborators inside and outside of the university um, so that the students can work on projects that deal with uh, uh, both um, uh, basically environmental issues. Um, and then and then the polar guys project, um, our plan is to um, is to expand the scope of it. And so we we in episode four, we uh, we focused on the um, similarities and differences uh, um, um, between uh, Indonesia um, and um, and the Netherlands. And um, I think what I think our next our next step is to look at the global south. And uh, and to work with a, an organization within Penn um, called Penn Global um, uh, to try to try to figure out what kinds of what kinds of um, relationships we can build and uh, with uh, uh, with experts and with artists in uh, the global south, so that so that animations could be produced um, not necessarily uh, in our voice, but um, that we could we, we can uh, sort of assist. Um, um, with the process, um, e you know, through, um, uh, I guess, through collaboration, education, um, and, and dialogue, basically, uh, to, to, to try to, to expand the, the scope of the project. So I think we'll continue to work with the Netherlands um, and, and now um, and, and, and try to reach further. Yeah, I love that. Um, another question is, who ideally is your target audience for these animations? Um, well, it's um, I, I've been thinking about it because I came to the project, um, you know, after the first episode. Mm -hmm. The uh, I thought I thought I thought that there was um, quite a lot of potential for uh, high school, college uh, 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 people in the Netherlands who um, uh, want to um, um, kind of hear an outsider's perspective, um, mm -hmm. because um, Simon is both in some ways an insider, in some ways an outsider to um, to the Netherlands. So we can look at it from a distance. The, the Netherlands um, consults on projects all over the world. Um, and so there's many countries that are uh, um, dealing with the same issues and are looking to the Netherlands because, because in terms of um, their approaches, uh, uh, they, um, they're, they're quite sophisticated solutions. And so um, I think that um, our audience is uh, includes in uh, people who are making decisions about um, what strategies their own countries should take. And um, I also think that uh, I've, I've noticed as we've visited universities that um, uh, our, our, our colleagues at other universities that um, teach uh, um, 
in in the areas of uh, um, um, uh, like civil engineering planning um, and so on are using the videos, especially especially in um, in the Netherlands. So uh, there are some there, the, the videos are being used uh, in um, in education. Um, and also in terms of um, policy, so that that's our hope, and um, and it may expand. But I think I think we want to make sure that it's uh, that these are videos that um, are going to create the kind of change that's that's really uh, sort of uh, crucially important, <laughs> drastically important mm -hmm. now, um, uh, uh, and that's that's the main number one priority over uh, let's just say like like um, education for children. It's not it's not that it's uh, it's for change. I love that. I love that. Um, this question might be geared a bit for Annabelle and Melody. Uh, animation technically is extremely difficult. What was your favorite part of the whole project or process? Um, I feel like I can probably speak for most of the team that we had like a lot of fun working on the character design. So before we even started like with the actual script, so like in pre-production, we got the chance to sort of like sketch out our own little like metaphors and things like our visual metaphors, things like that. Um, and because we were in the Netherlands, which is where Miffy was created, if you guys don't know what Miffy is, <laughs> it's like a little like bunny character, cartoon character. And we all became obsessed with Miffy. Like by the end, we each had like, I have a Miffy lamp in my room now. We all have Miffy t-shirts and Miffy merch. But when we were making these like characters, we were like drawing out these little like Miffy, um, like Dutch characters to put in the animation. It didn't make the final cut because we weren't sure about copyright rules. Um, but we did still have like the fun, like the little scuba looking dudes in our animations and like even just creating like Professor Poltergeist. Um, sort of like shape and things like that. We all were having so much fun collaborating on that part. I love that. I yeah. love that. I, oh, yeah, I really like um, like the storyboarding part because a lot of our time and um, when we were at the farmhouse, we were mainly storyboarding on our own sections, but we also like shared our ideas. And then I remember how Annabelle and I were brainstorming how to animate peatlands. So um, it's like a very specific structure, uh, ground structure in the Netherlands. And it's like really, it's for like under underground water drainage. And then we came up with the idea of like animating this Dutch cake. So like the cake layers represent each core layers. And then we have like candles to symbolize like wind turbines and then but it's like not used in our final production, but it's always fun to like explore different ideas and then like choosing what we want to put in the animation. Because we really use a lot of like creative metaphors or like symbols in our um, videos. I love that. Yeah, the cake metaphor feels perfect for describing all the different layers of sediment and stuff. Um, Here's another question. This is a question that I had is what are some of the benefits that you guys found using animation as a medium for addressing topics like climate change, which can be really difficult to sometimes explain into words? Um, yeah, I guess what were some of those benefits of animation? Um, so like one thing that we loved about working with animation is that we got to work on these like really extended visual metaphors. Um, in the storyboarding process. And like, for instance, in the clip we just showed, there's a part called like the Dutch Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. And in this case, that visual idea was developed like over time. And we didn't just want to purely illustrate what was happening on the islands. But with this like Gold Coast metaphor, we wanted to show how dredging was both creating profit and proliferating across the Netherlands while still being accurate to the actual dredging process. Um, so like with little things, we wanted to be really accurate. For example, like the birds on the island, that's sort of a nod to how during dredging, they're actually bringing up a lot of marine life along with the sand. So that causes swarms of animals to come and feast on the organisms um, on land. And then like with the people lounging on the beach chairs, that's a nod to the profiting dredging company employees. Um, so little details like that were really important to us when we were illustrating like the visualizations and using animation. I love that. Very strategic and, and smart, smart choices made. Um, 
here is, I think I'll take our last question, is what um, what stylistic choices did the group make during the process to make um, the whole project seem cohesive? I know before you had spoke about the color palette, What's, what were some of those other stylistic pieces and components that came into play? Uh, Melody, do you want to uh, answer that? Or I, I can I can add some things, whatever you... Did you oh, I I think we have like a specific stroke um size like the pen size I think it's like seven, and then we decided so in episode four we only decided on one single like size but then for this one I think we have like a thick pen and then a thin pen to get more variations so that was really fun to explore with, and then I think we did. Like we encourage you encourage us to do like hand drawn animations instead of like animating with like After Effects like the keyframes, but then we sort of like prioritize using frame by frame representations. Right. Yeah. So that was I think. Well, we I mean every time that we do this is kind of an experiment. So the uh, uh, we've by by coordinating color and line weight. Um, that takes a kid that that makes at least the uh, the 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 drawn um, uh, the drawn elements kind of look a little bit more similar. Um, uh, we use camera motion and um, and we do use some keyframing, but I was really pushing everyone to see if we could if we could do as much animation by hand to kind of get the to keep to to, to keep the image moving. I think also um, everybody was seeing each other's work um, as because we we use a, a shared cloud folder, and w w as we were working on the animatics, we would watch them together. So everybody was kind of seeing how things were working, and so I think that there's some cohesiveness that happens where someone sees someone else's finished color shot and then they kind of, um, you know, they know what level they need to bring theirs up to. I, and I think also with animation, there's a there's a sort of economy of um, distributing your effort across your minute or your your two minutes. Um, so like you you don't you don't put all of the uh, hard work in the first 10 seconds, you kind of bring it up um, um, and add animated animated details um, uh, you know in July and in August and kind of bring up the level of interest um, um, where needed. And then we sometimes in the discussions we think of funny things that can happen or we push things, you know, change the cinematography a little bit. And so I think uh, Simon and I have also given a lot of feedback along the way that um, uh, uh, that sometimes, like we realize, there's opportunities the way that the two two clips fit together. Um, uh, there's opportunities to to sort of refer back to something in someone else's clip. So we're always looking for these ways to sew this together um, even more, so it seems it seems uh, unified. I love that, and I do have one one final question before we close out. Thank you, Pat. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway from your time in the Netherlands during your month long visit? We could each answer it shortly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you have an idea, Annabelle? Um, this is like maybe not what you were going for, but the first <laughs> thing I thought of was we actually like had this one moment in the Netherlands where like a lot of our equipment was um stolen by a Croningen thief. Um, and that really <laughs> taught me to like, you know, re be safe be careful wherever you are and make sure to take care of your equipment but one thing we actually got out of that is we were able to still like work with our like Wacom tablets but initially we were all working on like the really big ones and then we mm -hmm. sort of each started switching into like using the smaller ones and like sharing and different things like that which actually ended up helping our teamwork and making us more responsible as our little animation team players a good life lesson right there <laughs> um for me it's definitely i don't know like the whole country is so just so different because i'm actually from taiwan and then like coming from like an east asian country it's like i'm from taipei it's really city like and then now like going to netherlands um it's like because we didn't really go to amsterdam or like rotterdam like the big cities there we we went to like the like the farmhouse mm -hmm. and also like very rural places or um places with like the water crisis so it's just really interesting to look at you know like different landscapes like they're so they're so pretty but at the same time it's like oh like these 
places are going to sink if the government doesn't do anything about it. So it's just really cool because um, cause we also went to Utrecht University and then we met up with a TNO researcher and then he told me that UNESCO actually also went to Taiwan to do, to do like a like a water management um, research, which is just really cool to see like the connections, which is really surprising. And it also contributes a lot to what I'm learning about the world. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, th I found it amazingly, uh, I mean, the, the layers, um, uh, I, th I guess it's kind of like that Winnie the Pooh example where um, at first I, I, I saw um, uh, Hostrecht and I were riding the bike through it. And, and this is, this is probably my fourth time to the Netherlands, but, but um, as we met with experts, the, the sort of the layers that we uncovered and that we understood that like simultaneously we're five meters underwater, simultaneously we're standing on compressed peat, like, and, 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 um, so I guess it's like the dimension of time, the dimension of history, the dimension of uh, of the energy that's being used to sort of allow us to stand here right now. Those kinds of th those layers are not something that I would get just by traveling to the Netherlands um, and sort of taking a road trip through through the, through the country. I think the things that we saw sort of um, uh, um, helped us understand the complexity, um, the sort of cultural. Uh, the, the the cultural geographic um, uh, sort of uh, uh, the housing issues like the complexity and layers of of um, uh, that 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 any country who <laughs> that's coastal um, will will need to deal with in the in the in the near future. Absolutely, and I I, I lied. One more question for you, Josh. Uh, any collaboration opportunities with other universities or institutions across the world for future projects? I'd love to hear about them. That would be great. Yes, all of them. Bring yeah. them to us. Yeah, I yeah, would love to hear about those. Yes. <laughs> well, oh, I think I mean, that will that wrap it up happen. today. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, for more information on upcoming Connected Inc. events, if you're looking for inspiring creative stories, tips, and techniques for improving your creative skills, Make sure to follow Wacom on all of our social media channels. Uh, you can also head over to the community blog, which is community.wacom.com. Uh, if you happen to be in the Portland, Oregon area, make sure to visit us at the Wacom Experience Center. Uh, we'll drop some links in the chat for y'all to find information on us as well. Of course, thank you so much to Joshua, Annabelle, and Melody. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for showing us the videos. That was truly amazing. Um, if y'all didn't think animation could do the work, it really can. And this is proof that it can. So thank you guys for sharing that with us. We're really excited to see the upcoming sessions and to follow along and see what you guys have planned for the future. Um, if you're also interested in finding out uh, current products and what deals are happening, any promotions, go ahead and head over to the community blog as well. There's a whole list of promos up there ripe for the taking. Uh, and lastly, uh, our next Connected Ink stream will happen on November 15th and will feature the creators of Panchita, which is an amazing animated movie. Uh, it's a really beautiful story. So make sure to mark your calendars for November 15th. Uh, turn on those notifications on YouTube so you can get reminders. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to the one with Bear Sarah Jean in the back end for running our streams. Thank you to the chat. And we will see you guys online and at the next Connected Inc. event. Thanks, y'all. Have a wonderful rest of your day.